Uh, let me begin by saying that even though this is a controversial book, it doesn't begin with a controversial starting point. Uh, my claim that voters know very little about politics and economics is very widely accepted by social scientists. Uh, it is completely common among political scientists who know the data, completely common among economists. Uh, the, really, the, 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 the real point of controversy is this. Uh, while many sci while, while social scientists will generally agree that voters know very little about politics and economics, they will often then add, it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't really matter that people don't know what they're talking about when they vote. Uh, even though democracy is supposed to be ruled by the people, it doesn't actually require that the people know what they're doing. Right now, this seems like a somewhat surprising claim, uh, right? Because you say, how could it not matter? Right? If you were talking to a doctor who's about to perform surgery, and it turns out that he thinks the heart is on the wrong side of the human body, you might become somewhat nervous and say, look, how can he do his job if he doesn't understand human anatomy? And somebody says, well, don't worry about it. He, somehow he figures it out. Somehow he does a good job, even though he doesn't have a lot of book learning about the human body. He'd be, oh, probably be I very nervous. And say, you know, I think you I would need some of this book learning in order to competently perform surgery. And I'd be surprised if will, this guy will, could cut me open and do no harm, given that he doesn't seem to know what he's doing. Well, it turns out there is an answer that social scientists have to this question of how could it not matter? How could it possibly not matter that voters don't really know what they're talking about? And the answer goes back to basic statistics. Uh, in statistics, is something called the law of large numbers. Some people have heard of this law? Yeah, so uh, this is why, for example, if you roll a whole lot of dice and then take the average, you'd expect the average to be pretty close. you expect the average of the actual rolls to be pretty close to the average, uh, to be pretty close to the uh, uh, theoretical average or the expected value. All right, so basically, the, uh, basically what basic statistic tells us is that random errors tend to cancel out, uh, which means that uh, in democracy, uh, if people don't know what they're doing, basically just flip a coin to decide what to do, then their random errors will cancel out, uh, which means the well-informed are actually in charge. Okay, so in other words, the defense of how democracy works despite widespread voter ignorance is say, look, the people who don't know what they're doing, flip a coin, Half of them vote one way, half of them vote the other way, and then they, they balance each other out. And who decides what really happens? The people who decide what really happens are the people who have a lot of information. They're the people who understand what the candidates think, they're the people who understand policy. And for candidates to win, they need their support because the other people aren't paying attention anyway. Okay, so suppose, for example, that we start with a scenario that is more extreme than, what the, than the one in the real world. Suppose that 90% of Americans literally knew zero about politics. They knew absolutely nothing. So these people don't even know who the president is. They don't know what country they're in. They don't know anything. All right, so, but they're, for, some, for some reason, they still want to vote. All right, so they're waiting in line to vote, knowing absolutely nothing. And you go and start chatting with people waiting in line to vote. And you find, wow, 90% of the people know absolutely nothing. You know, so the election could be between, say, Hitler and some normal candidate. And half the people say, oh, I like the normal candidate. And the other half of the people running for him say, well, that Hitler guy, I don't know, seems nice enough. You know, the mustache is good. All right, so you might get pretty nervous saying, my God, we have a democracy, and almost everyone I talk to doesn't know what they're doing to the point where they're basically just flipping a coin to decide who to vote for. Well, if it's only 90% of the people that you're talking to, though, who don't know anything, uh, then if they're flipping a coin, if you've got a reasonably large number of voters, you'd expect that each candidate will get about 45% of the vote, 45 percentage points of the vote. So, I mean, you say, well, uh, that doesn't make me feel too good. Hitler's still getting 45 percentage points of the vote. That's kind of scary, right? But then suppose the remaining 10 percent are perfectly informed. So these people are walking Wikipedias, or they're walking edited Wikipedias. They know exactly what's going on. And you say, well, uh, it's nice to find out that one person out of every 10 knows everything. But since this is a democracy, that isn't much of a comfort, because these 10 percent of people, surely they're going to be overpowered by the 90 percent of people who don't know what they're talking about. So we've got 90% uh, of people who are flipping a coin to decide between Hitler and a normal candidate, 10 percentage of points of people who know, who know everything, but they're in a small minority. Uh, what happens? Well, assuming that the informed people would not want Hitler, right, I think, which I think is a fair assumption, uh, the 10 percentage points of, of, of the people who are informed would not want Hitler, then actually Hitler's going to get zero percentage points of their vote. The other guy will get 10 percentage points of the, of, of the well-informed vote, which means that Hitler will actually lose, getting only 45 percentage or 45 percent of the vote. The other candidate will win with 55%, and everyone can breathe a collective sigh of relief and say, you know, whew, uh, thank goodness that democracy didn't destroy the country this time. Okay? But you may say, well, but uh, what are the odds it's going to work out again? Well, actually, as long as the assumptions that I told you are true, it's going to basically work out that way every time. As long as the uninformed flip a coin and the well-informed know what they're doing, 
right, and uh, are able to figure out who the better candidate and what the better policies are, then it turns out that what candidates need to do in order to win is to get a support of a majority of the well-informed. Okay, and this is a very general result. As long as there's a reasonably large number of voters, in order to win, you must get a support of a majority of the well-informed, even when the well-informed are a tiny minority of the population. Okay, so this is an interesting result because, of course, suppose that everyone were perfectly informed. What would you need to win in a democracy then? Uh, you'd need a majority of the well-informed. Right? What if only 10% of people are well-informed? You still need a support of a majority of the well-informed, which then leads people to say, hey, well, the uh, democracy is looking pretty good. Uh, it's very robust to this problem of hardly anybody knows what they're talking about. Okay. All right. Now, this result has a special name. Uh, the name is the miracle of aggregation. The miracle of aggregation, it sounds like magic. 90% right? lead, 10% gold, mix it together, and it gives you a result that is as good as 100% as gold. Okay. Now, as far as I know, in chemistry, this doesn't work. Uh, last time I checked, I'm not that big on natural science, but as far as I understand, uh, middle, medieval alchemy has still not been perfected. Uh, so, uh, in the realm of chemistry, you cannot mix junk and good stuff to get something that is just as good as good stuff. However, uh, in democracy, this is a very simple argument for why you can. Why, why you can combine a population that, uh, where most people don't know what they're talking about with a small percentage of informed people and get a result that's just as good as if everyone knew what they were talking about. Okay, so this brings me to one of my favorite sayings, which is if it seems too good to be true, then it probably is. Okay, so uh, anyone here watch late night television and see ads about how you two can start your own alpaca farm? <laughs> yeah, so I, 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 I want to watch late night television. I haven't seen the commercial for a while because now I have a DVR, so I fast forward through the alpacas. But anyway, <laughs> uh, you two can start your own alpaca farm. These wonderful animals, you go and just send us $3,000, we will ship you an alpaca or two. And before you know it, they will have bred like rabbits, and you will be an alpaca magnate, and anyone can farm these animals in any location, you know, urban, wherever, you just put them out on your balcony, and you'll be making money hand over fist on these alpacas. Just send us your money real fast. Uh, you know, don't go, you know, if anyone tells you this won't work, don't listen to them, they want you to fail. Right? So go and send us the money, we'll send you the alpacas, and this is going to be great. All right, so I have never actually investigated any of these claims, and yet I have not sent them my alpaca money. Right? And the reason is I say, look, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. I just don't believe that I could successfully become an alpaca farm, a farmer in my spare time and make money hand over fist. And if that were really true, why would they be selling me these alpacas anyway? It just doesn't make sense. Okay, so my reaction to the miracle aggregation is similar. I say, look, it sounds really good, but how can that be true? It seems like there's something fishy going on here. And it turns out that if you read the fine print, there is a crucial assumption behind the miracle aggregation. And that assumption is that when people don't know what they're doing, they flip a coin. When people don't know what they're doing, they flip a coin. Or another way of putting it is they were just as likely to overestimate as to underestimate. For an even policy, there is, there is li they are equally likely to think that it's better than it really is or worse than it really is. Okay, now, when I first began reading this literature, I noticed that a lot of social scientists make this assumption and then use it to defend everything that they believe in. So I was thinking, wow, these are very smart people. They've put a lot of study into this area. Surely they wouldn't rest their entire belief system on an assumption that they've never even examined. Uh, but when I started looking more, I said, wow, uh, looks like there really isn't a lot of evidence one way or the other about whether or not this assumption is true. I found there's actually very little evidence one way or the other on whether or not people don't know what they're talking about actually do flip a coin or are equally likely to over and underestimate. So I found that when I talked to other economists, they would often give me a definitional argument. Say, look, how do we know that people, that people don't know they're talking about flip a coin to decide what to do? And many economists would say, well, it would be irrational to do otherwise. Say, and how do we know that it's irrational to do otherwise? Because that's the definition of rationality. You say, wait, there's something wrong here. Isn't that like a circular argument or something like that? Uh, Again, my friend Mike Humor, the philosopher, can tell me the technical definition of what that error is, but I was pretty sure that you can't just define things into existence and then make them so. Okay, so that didn't seem very convincing. And then when I went over to political science and talked to them and said, All right, so why do you guys believe that voter errors are random? Often they would give me a deer in the headlights look uh, and say, uh, we believe it because some economists told us it was true. I say, oh, uh, well, you know what? Uh, the economists don't really have much of an argument for it either. I say, oh. So we've been basing this all upon an argument from authority where the authorities haven't actually done their homework. You know, afraid, afraid so. Okay. So, of course, the fact that there's very little evidence on something doesn't show that it is wrong. Uh, so what I began, when I began this project, I started by saying, let's go and find some actual evidence on this and see what we can come up with. Okay. Now, it turns out there's basically three different methods where you might go and test whether or not people who don't know what they're talking about make random errors. 
Okay, the first one is the most straightforward. This is what I call the method of objective quantitative, compa uh, quantitative comparison. So what you do here is step one, you find out what the facts are. Step two, you ask people what they believe the facts are. Step three, you go and statistically test whether or not the public's average belief is approximately equal to the truth. Okay, so for example, you can first go to the a statistical abstract in the United States and find out what percentage of the U.S. budget is spent on foreign aid. And you'll find out the true number is approximately 1% of the U.S. budget. Then you can go and survey a random sample of Americans and ask them what percentage of the U.S. budget they believe is spent on foreign aid. And then if you do this, you'll often get a number of about 10%. Okay. Uh, now, of course, if we only asked three people, then it would be very hard to statistically test whether or not this was just bad luck or whether it was really a significant difference. But when you ask a lot of people, then you can apply statistics and say, hey, look, it is extremely unlikely that these 2,000 people that we asked gave an average answer of 10%, and yet the average American really believes 1%. Right? It looks like this is some pretty strong evidence that people overestimate the true fraction of money spent on foreign aid by a factor of 10, which is a lot. Right? It is a, it's a lot to overestimate something by a factor of 10. Okay? Now, when you apply this method, it turns out that there are large systematic errors on some very important questions. Uh, for example, just to take the budget, where you know, this is an area where there's some very clear-cut answers about how much we really spend, and you can ask people how much they think that we spend, and you can say, see things, for example, that Americans very sharply overestimate the level of spending on foreign aid and welfare, and they very sharply underestimate pension and health spending. Right? Very sharply underestimate pension and health spending. Okay, so that's one approach. Uh, a second method that is often used in political science is what is called the enlightened preference approach. See that? Okay. Uh, is that better? Okay. Hopefully that's better. Okay. Second approach often used in political science is called the enlightened preference approach. Uh, the idea here is this. Okay. First of all, we, we, we get a group of people and we give them two different surveys. First, the first one is a survey that is a test of their political knowledge. So think about that as a political IQ test or a PIQ test. This has questions where there are definite right and wrong answers, such as how many senators does each state have, how many states are there, who is the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. So you give them a bunch of questions like this where you see how much they really know about politics, and you score them. Okay. Uh, the second test is uh, a survey about their policy preferences. These are questions where you may say there is not an obvious cut and dried answer, right? but we can still find out what, it is, what policies the, 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 the people favor. Okay. So then what we do is we can statistically estimate preferences as a function of people's political IQ plus their other characteristics. Right, so what we do is we see, look, what kinds of policies do people with high political IQs favor? Right, now if you say, well, maybe people with higher incomes get high, you know, or have more education, so they get to score higher on this test. Well, then if you know some statistics, you say, all right, fine. Let's go and control for that. Let's go and compare people who have similar levels of income but different political IQs, and then see what different kinds of policies the people with higher political IQs favor. Or you can say, well, I think there's a whole bunch of differences between people with high political IQs and low political IQs. You say, fine, let's go and get data on all of those differences and then see whether or not political IQ still makes a difference. Okay, so it turns out that when you do this, political IQ almost always has a substantial effect on the policies that people favor. So it's not just a matter of different people of different interests, but rather within a group of people who are very similar in terms of their objective interests, people who know more generally favor different things than people who know less. Okay. Now then, once you've done this, you can actually take this one step further, and you can simulate what public opinion would look like if everyone had aced the political IQ test. So imagine everyone got a perfect score on that political IQ test. What would they want then? What would the entire population favor in that case? All right. So the result uh, is that people, in fact, would want some quite different policies than the ones that they have. All right. So just to give you one example from a very excellent book by Scott Althaus, political scientist. Uh, so uh, this, you know, he has you know, many examples in this book. Uh, you know, pretty much any question you're wondering, what is it that people who know more want more? Uh, this book will tell you. All right. So this survey, uh, but anyway, one survey, a question that he, that he, that he asked or that he, that he looked at, uh, asked which of the following two positions is closer to your views? Uh, quote, one, we need a strong government to handle today's complex economic problems, or two, the free market can handle these problems without government becoming involved. Now, if you look at the actual breakdown for the American public, this was 62% in favor of strong government, 38% in favor of free markets. And you can then take a look at the different, income, uh, the different group, uh, groups of the income distributions, the different income quartiles, and you can see that in the lowest income quartile, it's basically 75% you know, wanted to rely upon strong government. Uh, and you, but you can even go to the highest quartile, and you'll see that only 49% of the highest quartile wanted to rely upon, the, well, let's see, let's see, uh, wanted to rely upon free markets. 
All right, so, you know, so anyway, the, the shaded area is what people really said. All right, the unshaded area is what people would have said if they had gotten a perfect score on the political IQ test. Okay, so what you can see is that there is a large increase in support for free markets. Uh, it actually is enough to switch the majority position. Uh, it goes from 62.38 to 47.53. Now, what's particularly interesting is that this uh, work allowed there to be a different effect for every income group, because you might say, well, maybe informed poor people will be, against, will be more against free markets, whereas more informed rich people will be more in favor of free markets. Uh, what Aldous found is, in this case and in many others, generally information works in the same way for everybody. Okay, so it's not that there's different people with different interests, and if they know more, they are better at picking out their interests, but rather, informed people of all sorts generally see pretty eye to eye. And in fact, in this uh, particular case, the information effect uh, for the lowest group was actually much larger than, than for the highest income group. So it's very well informed poor people are much more in favor of free markets than poorly informed poor people. Okay, so just one example, but gives you an idea. Okay. Now, finally, we come to the method that I relied upon, and this is the method of layman expert comparison. The idea of this approach is to see whether layman and experts systematically disagree, controlling for other factors. Uh, the key assumption that I'm using here, which upsets many people, is that if experts and laymen disagree about something, then the experts are probably right and the laymen are probably wrong. Okay, so people who've studied a subject for many years are more likely to be right than people who've never studied a subject. Okay, so uh, the assumption aggravates many people, but uh, now, you know, what I will say is, look, I'm not saying this is, uh, this is necessarily true. I'm open to counterarguments, but I will say this is my starting point, and if someone says that we should rely upon people who've never studied a subject rather than people who've studied for many years, I'd at least like to know why. I'd like you to explain why exactly it is that we should so distrust the experts on a subject. Okay, uh, the result is that there are very large systematic different disagreements on important questions, uh, which, include, uh, which include systematically biased beliefs about economics. Okay, now, of course, since I am an economist, this is especially interesting to me, and I won't deny, yes, I love economics, I live and breathe economics, I think all day about economics, all my friends are economists, yes, we love it, uh, but <laughs> I will say that there's more reason to be interested in economic, you know, to be interested in bias about economics than just the fact that economics is the greatest subject ever, uh, except maybe philosophy, of course, for my, my friend the philosopher, uh, but... <laughs> Uh, first of all, economics is, is uh, highly relevant to most modern policy debates. So for almost any policy debate people are having, economics has something to say. Okay. Uh, second reason is that economists have an interesting quirk, which is that we have we spent a long time complaining about how the public misunderstands our subject. This is different from the complaints that physics might, physicists might have about the public. Physicists are likely to say, the public is bored with our subject, public doesn't care about physics. But I rarely run into a physicist who says that on the first day of physics class, Students come out to me and say, look, you physicists believe in gravity, right? Well, let me tell you why gravity's wrong. Helium balloons. Have you ever thought of that, Mr. Professor? All right. Until you explain that, I don't see why I should have to listen to you. All right. Physicists generally don't have to put up with this kind of abuse. However, economists do. Economists do, yes? We teach an introductory economics class. Students really will come up to you and say, look, you guys don't understand what's going on with international trade. Really? Um, hmm. All right, um, share. Do share. You don't understand. It's, these products are coming from China, and their wages there are lower. Now do you understand how wrong you are? No, I still don't understand how wrong I am. It, uh, in fact, that's a key part of the whole argument. But, uh, and then they'll say, oh, well, you're so dogmatic. Well, why don't we wait till we get to that part of the course, and then you can explain to me what is wrong with the textbook. Okay, and yes, uh, I will say that most of my personal experience of this comes with arguing with my dad. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, he's a very smart guy. He's a PhD in electrical engineering, uh, and yet... Uh, he is constantly explaining to me how all the nation's problem, all the economy's problems can be solved with two simple policy changes. Uh, policy change number one is a naval blockade of Japan, right? Or, <laughs> or actually these days it's a naval blockade of China, including, must include China and you know, just all of Asia to make sure because you never know what new terrible country will emerge in China and start trying to destroy us. So it's just blockade off the entire continent. And uh, policy change number two that my dad has long believed would, would, would finally restore our country to the, to the greatness we enjoyed in the 50s is a Berlin Wall the Mexican border. So if you just do these two things, the naval blockade, the Berlin Wall, then everything would be great. Okay, so and again, the fact that I got a PhD in the subject and uh, has in no way changed his confidence in explaining to me what the answer is. And again, it's not like my dad has read the textbook and says, look, Brian, on page 38, there's a mistake. Take a look at equation three. Uh, it's not like that. He just has the strong opinion, despite the fact that he couldn't explain to you at, at all what is in the textbook and has no interest in hearing about it. Well, I mean, I, I mean, I told him, yeah, I told him a few times, but yes, doesn't have any interest. 
Okay, so economists have been complaining about the public's misconceptions for a very long time, so that's kind of interesting too. <laughs> Um, you know, says, you know, so is it, um, does it actually check out, or economists just, is it, is it really just that economist students are saying, hey, you know what, you know what I'm going to say to pull this professor's chain? I'm going to tell him we shouldn't trade with China. See what he does. You know, watch him turn red. Okay. Now, there are some earlier surveys that, that were done about economic beliefs that were consistent with systematic bias. The main problem was they almost never asked identical questions. So it was always open to people to say, look, the reason why the answers between economists and the public are, are different is because they were asked different questions. Okay. So what I found was that there is a survey that some other people constructed called the Survey of Americans and Economists on the Economy. And what it did is it asked both an audience, uh, a general American audience and PhD economists specializing in investing policy, their views about different, uh, you know, on, on a lot of different questions about how the economy works. Okay, so uh, the main results that I got out of this survey uh, is the miracle of aggregation fails once again. Right, it is, uh, once again, uh, is not the case that people who don't, know, who don't know anything about a subject just flip a coin, right, or that they're equally likely to over or underestimate the effects of something. Rather, it turns out that there are very large systematic disagreements between economists and the public. There are clear patterns. Right? People who've never studied a subject, know nothing about it, tend to think that one answer is right, and it's the opposite of the answer that people who've studied the subject think. Right? So it's almost like reverse magnetism, right? where people who haven't studied a subject are repelled from the truth. Right, so it's, uh, it's interesting, it's curious, but uh, that is what we see. All right, now just to quickly give you some of the main patterns that, uh, that we can get out of the data. Uh, the first main pattern is something that I call, uh, call anti-market bias. Okay. So there is a general tendency for non-economists to underestimate the social benefits of the market mechanism. Right, now this isn't to say that all economists think that markets are great all the time, they certainly don't. But nevertheless, there is a very different perspective that economists have compared to the rest of the public. For economists, they look at a problem and they say, who could get rich by solving this problem? And if you have a good answer, then the economists say, all right, fine, we don't need to worry about it anymore. On the other hand, non-economists will often say, look, there's people getting rich off of this, and that's the problem. Right? A very different reaction. Right? So economists tend to worry about things like air pollution, where they say, we can't think of any way to get rich solving air pollution, so we're worried. On the other hand, non-economists are as, just as likely to get worried when someone is making money hand over fist solving a problem. Say, look, you understand, it's about greed. Right, so what's the problem with that? Well, you know, they really have these greedy intentions, so that's going to lead to bad results. And you have the economist saying, you know, that's not necessarily true. What if the way to get rich is by making the customer happy? Then it would seem like that would lead to good results because people would try to make the customer happy in order to uh, get rich. Right, so what's the problem? Right, now, there's uh, many examples of this that I could give you, but I like to give you the most controversial examples possible. So uh, you know, here's one of my favorite ones. As I look out throughout this room, I see a very large number of kidneys that people don't need. Right? <laughs> All right. pretty, pretty much every, every healthy person in this room has two kidneys, and as far as I understand, medically you only need one. Right? If you, get, you, know, you may say, well, don't I need a spare kidney in case you get sick? From what I understand, kidney disease generally affects both kidneys, so you don't really have a spare kidney. You only need one. And on the other hand, there's probably a number of people right here in Denver on dialysis, which is totally horrible. Right? So horrible that a friend of mine in the insurance industry says, that about 20% of people on dialysis just voluntarily go off and die. It's so miserable. All right, so now that you know this, are you inclined to go and donate your kidney to a stranger for free? You know, feel free to leave, and we'll all, we'll all cheer, cheer, cheer you in your, in your act of, 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 of helping save someone's life. Okay, uh, well, probably you're not going to, uh, because there's actually a law that says that while you may give your kidney to a stranger, you may not charge them for it, which means that there are hundreds of millions of perfectly good kidneys that are just being wasted in the U.S. right now, and on the other end, there's a whole bunch of people who desperately need them who can't get them because you know, they don't have a person who really cares about them who's a compatible donor, then they're stuck. Okay. Now, what do economists say about this? And you know, not just weird economists, not just right-wing economists, but almost every economist I've ever talked to, look, we need to create a market in human kidneys. We need to legalize the selling of kidneys so that people who uh, need a kidney can buy it. Right? And it probably would only cost a few thousand dollars right? because you know, even if you wouldn't sell your kidney for a few thousand dollars, as a lot of people would, and even if Americans wouldn't, there's a lot of people in other countries who would want to, right? Which, again, freaks many people out. They say, well, I mean, poor people in other countries would sell kidneys just because they need the money. And again, economists would say, yes, uh, poor people who really need money would then go and give kidneys to people who really need kidneys, and this is a problem. Why? <laughs> Isn't that good? When people who need, need money get money, and people who need kidneys get kidneys, why, are you, why is that such a problem? You don't understand. <laughs> you know, they're poor people. Like, I, no, I do understand. That's actually why it's even better than it might initially appear, is because they really need that money. Because they're hungry, and they don't need a kidney, they need the food. Right? Their, their, their child is going to die unless they can sell this kidney, and you won't let them, and why not? Okay, so this is only one example, but it's one that I'm very fond of. 
Uh, <laughs> because on the one hand, it's very controversial, and almost everyone thinks it's a bad idea to have a market in human kidneys. And yet, you know, even when I talk to Marxist economists, I was I said, so what do you guys think about market in human kidneys? Well, the, the graduate students were sort of like, eh. And then the, then the Marxist professor said, you know, we have to do this. All right, <laughs> all right. Thumbs up for thumbs up to the Marxist economist who told his, his Marxist graduate students that we do need to legalize a market that almost no American would would would, would accept. Okay. So that's one example of anti-market bias. There are others, but uh, we do have limits of time. Uh, another another big difference that you see between economists and the public is what I call anti-foreign bias. So it's one thing for Americans to say, look, when one American buys something from another, then probably both are better off. Uh, but what if an American buys something from a Chinese? Surely that's totally different, right? And what economists are around to say is, no, it's actually it's not different. It's the same thing, right? They're better off, we're better off. And the fact that they're in another country really doesn't make any difference. And probably the best way to explain the economist's thinking on this is with a little fable. Uh, it is the fable of the factory that turns wheat into cars. Right? And here's how the fable goes. A man goes and builds a factory on the coastline. And uh, he says he's got some amazing machine that turns wheat into cars. And you see big trucks full of wheat go into that factory and then cars come out, right? And you have a bunch of chemists saying, I don't understand how he does it. Chemically, wheat cannot be turned into a car, right? And they sit around saying, how is this possible? Arguing about what the machine must be. Is it some advanced kind of fusion? Finally, a journalist goes and sees in the factory, and it turns out the factory is empty. All that it has are docks and ships. And what, are, <laughs> and what do the ships do? Well, they take wheat, they sail them across the ocean of Japan, they put cars on them, and they come back, right? And then there's a giant scandal. The factory shut down. Everyone says, how awful. Well, you know, what this guy was doing, it wasn't really a machine for turning wheat into cars, it was just trade with the Japanese. Can you believe, you know, believe what he was doing here? And of course the economist's point is, no, no, no. It was correct the first time. That factory was a machine, it did contain a machine for turning wheat into cars, not the kind of machine you're thinking about. But you know, the fact that Japanese even exist is irrelevant to the, point, uh, to the technology. The fact there's other people in other countries doesn't make the slightest difference from the American point of view. All that matters is that you put wheat goes in, cars come out. Who cares how you do it? Okay. Uh, another big difference between economists and the public is uh, something I will call make work bias. Uh, non economists tend to evaluate economies based upon employment. Economists tend to do it based upon production. Right? Now, of course, it's easy to understand why people look at employment and say, isn't that a good thing? Well, uh, suppose we come up with a, with a new technology that allows us to produce a lot more with a lot fewer people. Uh, for example, the tractor. Right? So in 1850, almost all Americans were farmers. We had a lot of advances in agricultural technology. As a result, a ton of farmers lost their job. And the, and the long run result, of course, is that we're here today instead of farming. So instead of farming, we are here today listening to this talk. Okay, now, if we had completely, if we had blocked, the, blocked progress in order to save jobs, it's true some people would not have lost their jobs. On the other hand, we also would not have had the modern world. Now, the thing is, is at the time when farmers were losing their jobs, we've gone to an economist and said, well, what do you expect people to do now they've lost their jobs? Really, all the economists could have said, like, something, something else? I don't know. If I knew, I wouldn't be talking to you. I'd be going and setting up factories to do that something else. Right? So it doesn't seem very convincing at the time to say people lose their jobs are going to do something else. But that is the right answer. You know, certainly in 1850, you wouldn't say, I don't know, they'll invent the internet or something like that. You wouldn't have any idea. Well, you, know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have even, even any conception of what that would be. And yet it is because that, we, that, that productivity has been allowed to improve that we have the, we have the modern world that we see around us. Right? And the last big difference that we see between economists and the public is something they call pessimistic bias. Uh, the public is more likely than economists to see a world in decline that is bad now and is going to get even worse. Uh, you may be inclined to say, well, isn't that true at least now? Even there, uh, since I remember the 80s, I will say, you know what? Things are still way better than they were in the 80s. Right? In the 80s, so, it's like we, so what was considered a fast modem in the 80s? <laughs> yes. you know, 1,200K. Right? You know, 1,200K. All right, so yeah, that was considered a fast modem. Let's see, I had a VIC-20 that had 4K of RAM, no hard drive. Right? So uh, yes, and of course there was no internet. Right, so, and any, or you just go and look at television. We had like three channels. Uh, we had a, I had a black and white television. In order to get reception, I had to put my hand on the antenna to serve as a human antenna to get the channels to come in. Okay, so, uh, compare that to what we have now during you know, the, uh, the worst recession since the Great Depression. Uh, by comparison, things are looking really quite amazing, right? but people tend to uh, focus on the negative rather than saying, wow, things are fantastically good compared to how they were only 20 years ago. Okay. Now, we come to the question of, could the experts be biased? Uh, of course they can be biased, right? And there, there are good reasons to distrust experts. So if you go to an auto mechanic and he says you need a $2,000 repair, you are probably distrustful. And if he says, well, who do you, what do you know? I'm the mechanic. I've been doing this for 10 years. You might still say, yeah, but also, if there was no problem at all, you can make $2,000 by telling me that I have a big problem. So that's why I don't trust you. And that's a perfectly good reason to distrust an expert. 
but suppose that you go and talk to a mechanic who knows he's not going to get your business, and he tells you that you need a $2,000 repair. Then you might start saying, I don't know, maybe he like knows another mechanic in town, maybe that's his goal. All right, fine. What if it's your son, the mechanic, who tells you you need a $2,000 repair? Then it starts to be kind of paranoid to say, I mean, um, what do you know? <laughs> I, I, I understand this a lot better than you do. This is all part of some scheme. That's a point where you say, you know, you really have, you know, this person has your best interest at heart. You have no reason to trust them. It seems very arrogant to say that you know better when they've studied the subject for years and you don't know anything about it. Okay. That is at least my reaction. Okay. So uh, in terms of reasons to distrust economists, there's actually two very popular reasons floating around. Uh, and again, economics are not the most popular occupation. There are many people who spend their lives denouncing us. Okay, so, and what are the main reasons they've offered for distrusting us? Uh, one is what I call self-serving bias. It says, look, economists are rich, they got tenure, they're fat, they're happy, everything's going well for them. Of course they think that, not, that everything is right in the world. Right? So whatever is good for them is good for the world, so naturally they are indifferent to the suffering of others, and they have all these crazy views about the kidneys and, and so on. All right, so that's one story about why economists can't be trusted. Another one says, look, economists are a bunch of extreme right-wing ideologues. They have been you know, you know, living and breathing hard right republicanism since they were three years old. Then they go into economics because that's where they can be with other like-minded ideologues. The only people who go to grad school are people who are dogmatic adherents to this religion. And then they've locked down the occupation because no one who, does, no one who disagrees with this crazy stuff would want to be a part of this horrible club. All right, so that's another story. Okay, call that ideological bias. Well, uh, the main problem with these stories is that they're actually testable. Right? So this is like getting up on a stand and saying, look, the witness couldn't possibly commit the crime because he was elsewhere. Well, then we can go and get the camera footage and see, well, was the guy really out in, that, in that other place or not? Right? Similarly, when you go and say the problem with economists is that they're rich, they've got job security, the right wing, well, we can go and get some data and see, well, is that true? And if that's true, let's go and then compare people who are non-economists, who are similar in other ways, and see, what, and, and see how they compare. Okay, so for example, you think that uh, the reason why economists have their funny views is because they're rich and have a lot of job security. Let's go and look at non-economists who are equally rich and have an equal amount of job security and see if they think like economists too. Or similarly, you think that the reason why economists have these strange views is that they're right-wing ideologues. Let's go and find some liberal democratic economists, see what they think, see whether they disagree. It turns out when you apply these tests that the belief gap between economists and the public barely, basically stays the same. Uh, controlling for you know, income, job security, so on, shrinks a very large gap by less than 20%, and uh, controlling for party ideology actually makes the gap a little bit bigger, because here's the thing, it's not even true that economists are right-wing. Typical economist is a moderate Democrat. You know, he's a moderate Democrat who thinks that downsizing is good for the economy, but still he's a moderate Democrat. Okay, so uh, these stories do not check out. Okay, so uh, now in the next question, many economists will, will I say is, look, granted what you're saying is true in fact, how is it possible in theory? Okay, which sounds kind of funny. But uh, to go back to that whole helium and physics example, it's not as funny as it sounds. Uh, you know, when, you go, when you go and see, look, heli you know, helium balloons float, how do, you know, can physics explain that? You might want to, before you say the physics, physics has been disproven, you might want to go and talk to the physicist and say, look, is there any like, footnote in your theory about how helium could float? And he may say, actually, yes, and it's not just a footnote. It's, it's, ex it's actually specifically predicted by the theory. Oh, oh, good. Okay, so, all right, so let's see. All right, so how exactly is it possible that the public could be so wrong about so many areas. Okay, well, uh, the standard story that economists give is something called rational ignorance. Uh, it says, look, people don't know very much about subjects where they, that they have very little incentive to learn. Okay, so the reason why the public doesn't know much about this is because you can get through life just fine without understanding economics very well. Okay, and something I'll actually say is basically true. I know, you know, I know plenty of successful businessmen who are economically illiterate. So, you know, economics is more about understanding policy than it is about understanding how to run a particular business. Okay, but anyway, uh, rational ignorance, I'll say, actually doesn't work. Uh, now, one thing is that the way that economists normally think about it is, is actually rules out systematic error, so that's sort of a theoretical problem. But the, you know, the real substantive problem is this. Rational ignorance does not explain why the uninformed are not agnostic. Normally, if you have never studied a subject, you are agnostic about it. Look, I've never, I don't know anything about the history of ancient Samaria, therefore I don't have strong opinions about ancient Samaria. Whatever. I don't know. Was it a, was it a, was it a monarchy? Was it, you know, was it a matriarchy? No. All right. And if someone who had studied it told you, you wouldn't say you're lying or you're evil. Uh, you'd say, oh, well, the guy who studied it says that. I guess he's right. Okay. So this doesn't, this doesn't explain why the uninformed are not agnostic. And yet if there's one thing that you can see in the public's economic views is that they are not agnostic about much. Right. People who cannot explain anything about the international trade textbook generally are convinced that we must do much more to keep out foreign products. They have a strong opinion 
almost precisely because they don't know anything about the subject. Okay, and the same goes for many other areas. Right? You know, basically, almost everyone who can explain the, the economic argument for legalizing market human kidneys agrees with the argument. And on, on the other hand, uh, the, the people who don't believe in legalizing market human kidneys, pretty much none of them can explain the standard argument. And again, of course, there's a difference between being able to explain an argument correctly and agreeing with it. But it is interesting to see that mere ability to explain what the argument is generally leads to agreement. And of course, lack of ability means that you uh, disagree. Okay. Now, another thing that rational ignorance does not explain is emotionalism. Why do the people get upset about this stuff? Why do the people start screaming and yelling about subjects they know nothing about? Well, uh, I mean, if it's just rational ignorance, you'd think that people wouldn't, wouldn't really care. So, look, I don't know anything about it. Why would I get upset about it? And yet, uh, I have found in general that if you go to a political meeting and politely disagree with everything that they stand for, you will not make a lot of friends there. Right? <laughs> My lawyer tells me not to advise you to, to, to actually do this, but hypothetically, if you want to test this out, just go to a meeting of people that you totally disagree with and in the friendliest possible way, explain why they're wrong about everything and see how many friends you make. Uh, it'd be, it'd be, it would be an interesting experiment if one were to try it. Let's say that. Okay, now here I think about the case of the tariff. Uh, so, again, coming back to my dad. <laughs> yes, uh, you know, so in the 90s, uh, Bill Clinton imposed a tariff on Mexican oranges. And at the time I was thinking, so what would my dad say about this? Uh, well, I mean, according to rational ignorance, my dad would say, I didn't know there's a tariff on Mexican oranges. Um, you know, who knew? Or you would say, what's a tariff? Or like, where's Mexico? Right? But, <laughs> or what's Mexico? Uh, but I said, that's not how my dad would react. My, the way my dad would react would be, it's about time we finally got to help the Mexicans. Those oranges have been ruining our country. The only question is whether we can come back from the brink. Right? That is a more common reaction that you get to in discussions of tariffs. Right? So it does not seem consistent with, ra with, with rational ignorance. Okay. So this brings me to my alternative story, which I call rational rationality. And it begins with the question of this. Why would people be rational some of the time, but irrational other times? So I noticed, so again, if I were stranded on a desert island and I had to pick one person I knew to save me, I'd probably pick my dad because he knows how to build stuff. He can go and take a scrap heap and turn it into a car. All right, so I can't do that. I wouldn't know where to begin. So I think my dad could save my life. So, and very few of my other friends could do that. So uh, very rational in areas like being, being able to build a raft out of makeshift materials on a desert island. On the other hand, though, on the question of the tariff, completely ridiculous. OK, so why would this be? Well, uh, here's my answer. Why don't we think about irrationality as a good that, people, that we use to protect comforting beliefs from reality? Right? So, and again, the problem with being rational is that you might have to change your mind. If you're open to facts and evidence, or you have facts, evidence, logic, then you always have to worry. Maybe someone's going to come along with some evidence that shows I'm wrong, and then we're going to have to throw away a belief that means a lot to me. Whereas, if you're totally irrational, you can keep believing whatever you want forever. Indefinitely, right? If you want to, if you're irrational, then whatever it is you believe today, you can continue to believe for the rest of your life, and no one can stop you. Okay. So why don't we just go and apply our usual economic tools here? We can put uh, the quantity of irrationality on the x-axis, put the price of irrationality on the y-axis, and think about this: some errors are costly, and others aren't. Okay. So, for example, if you are a surgeon who is so arrogant that you would get great pleasure from believing that you are better drunk than other people are sober. I'm a better surgeon drunk than other surgeons are sober. I'm that good. Well, on the one hand, one hand, that's a pleasant belief. But on the other hand, that is a belief that is likely to destroy your career. So few surgeons hold that belief. Right? On the other hand, uh, there are other subjects where you can be dead wrong forever, and you can live out your life in perfect comfort, safety, and, and, and wealth. Okay, so in one of these areas, well, areas like religion, philosophy, politics, errors are basically free. Right? You can be totally wrong about this stuff and does not actually ruin your life. In fact, you can run a successful business while thinking that we need to put a Berlin Wall around uh, a Berlin Wall at the Mexican border. Okay. All right. Now, you may, or just just to go back for one second. Again, you know. So why exactly is that anyone would want to be rational? Well, um, you know. So one basic thing is that people often get a lot of comfort out of their worldview. Uh, one of my favorite books is called *The God That Failed*. It's a bunch of autobiographies of ex-communists, and not one of them said, "I was happy to be to learn that communism was wrong because then I saw it stop being wrong." Instead, all, every single one of them said it was like having my heart ripped out of my chest to have to, to have to admit that I was wrong about something I devoted so much of my life to. Right? You know, people have a lot of beliefs where to admit they were, that they were wrong would hurt them, and hurt them quite deeply. Right? So by being irrational, they can prevent that from happening. And of course, the other thing is a lot of times people pick friends based upon shared beliefs. So you might lose your friends if you change your belief. Right? So maybe, maybe you say, no, my friends wouldn't purge me just because I stopped agreeing with them. Then again, maybe they would. Or maybe they just did like you a little bit less. Right, so another reason not to think about this stuff too much. Okay. Right now, uh, to ask uh, you know, a question that many economists uh, would pose, so why is this inefficient? 
Maybe all this shows is that the point of democracy is not to pick wise policies. Maybe the point of democracy is to serve as a giant system of group therapy. So it's a, it's a chance for all of us to feel good. Right? So we go and say a lot of nonsense, but we feel better about it, and that's the point. Well, uh, the main problem with this is that there's a big difference between what economists call the private cost of voter rationality and the social cost of irrationality. Okay? So you know, the classic example of this is pollution, right? where one more person drives a car makes the makes pollution a little bit worse, but it's barely noticeable. Right? It is not uh, against a person's interest to drive a car rather than walk, right? because you know, they do make the air a little bit dirtier, but it's so slight they can't even detect it. However, if a lot of people think this way, then everyone can be choking and coughing and wearing gas masks, right? as people sometimes will in some very polluted third world cities. Okay, so there's a difference between the private cost, the harm that is just done to one individual, and the social cost, the harm that is done to all the people who suffer the consequences of an action. All right, well, we can think about voter rationality as being a kind of political pollution. The majority can easily be better off if it doesn't get them at the policies the majority wants. A majority can vote for protectionism, every, one, every person feeling all patriotic and wonderful because they vote to keep out Chinese products, and yet, they can be, and yet it can still be a country they wouldn't want to live in when, they, when, when you actually have the consequences. So why is it they would vote for policies they don't want to live under? Because one person can't actually change what the policies of a country, right? So when you, if you go in and change your vote, would that have changed the outcome of the last election? Highly unlikely. Very, very, very unlikely. Okay, so the chance is quite small. So basically, it's the same thing with driving your car. You know, do you make the air a little bit more polluted when you drive your car? Yes, but not to a noticeable degree. Okay. All right, so let's see. How much time do, we, do I have here, Alex? Ten minutes? Ah, well, in that case, I will leave remedies for the, for the Q&A, and I will open it up to, open, open up to questions. Let's see. Happy to take any question on any, to any question on any topic on, on, on economics. I may not know, but uh, uh, sure. Question, but mm -hmm. I was hoping you could talk more about how uh, anti-market bias and these biases play out. Ah. Because I, I thought the examples mm -hmm. were in the book are really interesting. Maybe mm -hmm. this is a time you could share. Oh, uh, sure, sure. Of bias. Right. So. Uh, the most basic model in political science is called the median voter model, and it basically says that politicians move to the center of the distribution of public opinion in order to win. And while there are some problems with that, I think it's a very good starting place. So when you're considering, you know, so, so suppose most people think that protectionism is a good policy, then what does a politician need to do in order to get elected? He needs to say, I'm a protectionist, and I'm going to give you the policies that you want. Right? That is the way that you get elected, is by, is by, adop is by adopting policies that most people agree with. Uh, so you know, that, that is basically my, you know, my step one is to say, uh, with most people believe that a policy is good, then democracy is going to tend to deliver it. And you know, one of my standard challenges that I offer to students is this. Tell me the policies that exist that are unpopular. Tell me the policies that exist that are unpopular. Now, of course, many people believe that whatever they like is popular and all their friends agree with them. So therefore, the fact the policy doesn't exist is inexplicable. Uh, they say, you know what? Uh, oftentimes, you are weird and your friends are weird too. Uh, so you need to go to nationally representative public opinion data, and then you will often be shocked to learn that policies that you think are totally indefensible are supported by most people. Uh, you know, to take one example that economists talk about, most economists are under the delusion that the only reason why we have farm subsidies is because 2% of the population wants them and they force them down the throats of the other 98%. Yet, in the best survey ever done of support for farm subsidies, uh, over, you know, about 60% of Americans supported them. And uh, you know, actually, actually, you know, it's more like 80% supported them. And then, you know, about 80% about 80 of Americans support farm subsidies. These percentages are similar in farm and non-farm states. And if you say, like, why is it that um, that, that people in non-farm states want farm subsidies? Uh, well, the answer is that, you know, like, like one, one standard answer is they say, look, we need it in order to make sure there's enough food. All right, that's the kind of argument that most non-economists will give for why we need farm subsidies. It's to keep the food in the stores. Okay, which. You know, economists will say, you realize there's only like a few products that get subsidized, but there's like 10,000 products in the store. So how would you explain that? Uh, it's like, well, we only subsidize the ones that wouldn't be in the store if we didn't subsidize them. Aha. All right. But, ah, that fits the facts perfectly. Okay. So uh, now if you want to, you know, to get, a, get a, a more sophisticated theory, I think actually the real mystery of politics is why, why policy is not a lot worse. Because once you look at public opinion, you know, I often look at it and I'm in total despair and I say, my God, I can't believe that we've ever got out of the cave the way that people think. I mean, it just seems like their views are so awful. And so, you know, so what's going on? Well, I mean, you know, part of my explanation here is that when politicians, if politicians were to do exactly what the public asked for, it would be a disaster and the public would get very angry at the public for causing a disaster. So politicians have to carefully weigh how much to listen to the public. 
I often think about the case of Gray Davis in California, who, as far as I can tell, was thrown out of office because he did exactly what Californians told him to do, and it was a disaster. And so, so he paid the price. The next guy isn't going to make that mistake. The next guy is going to say, I'm going to do like half of what the public wants. And the stuff that's going to be really disastrous, I'm not going to do because then they're going to blame me for doing what they asked. Right? So I'm going to say, you know, writing this book, I actually started to acquire some sympathy for politicians, realizing, well, these guys really are in a lose-lose situation where people hate them if they don't do what they ask, and they also hate them if they do what, if they, do what they ask, and it turns out as any economist would predict. Okay? So uh, you know, not too much sympathy, but, but some. <laughs> See, do we have time for one more question? Oh, okay. Okay, uh, here we go. Ten more minutes. Oh, we have 10 more minutes. I thought you told me originally I had 10 minutes. I thought you had 10 more minutes to finish your talk. Ah, 10 more minutes to finish the talk. Ah, okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about, uh, economically, about the, the financial situation, the banking and all of that, and the perception mm -hmm. that it's a failure somehow mm -hmm. of the free market? Mm -hmm. uh, sure, I'd be happy to talk about that. Uh, so, uh, there's... You know, Number two, there's, there's so much to say, but uh, you know, for, you know, first key thing uh, you know, to point out is that uh, people generally leap to the conclusion that the free market is completely to blame for this, uh, whereas they say, look, we have a, we, uh, it is not true that there is no regulation of banking. Uh, far from it. There's a lot of regulation of banking. There's a lot of regulation of financial markets. So when we look at what has happened, we see, look, there's, you know, there's some element of markets, so there, there's uh, some element of government. The fact that people leap to the conclusion that markets are to blame and that regulation is the solution is, I think, a, you know, a very clear illustration of anti-market bias where something goes wrong, there's actually two suspects, and everyone points their finger at the one suspect. You know, if you go into a room and there's, uh, you know, a, a crime has been committed, there's, there's, and there's blood on two people's hands, and each of them says, hey, uh, it's, you know, it's the other guy did it and I was just trying to help the victim, uh, <laughs> you say, ah, well, but you're always to blame for it. I am? How do you know that? Well, because I, I just blame you for everything. Okay, so I think that, that is a very useful point to begin with is to look, it is not true that there has been no regulation. It's basically not even true to say there has been deregulation. Right? Uh, you know, there have been, as far as I can tell, there has been no major deregulation of, of, of banking or financial markets that, is, that, pe that is the people point to over, over the last 10, 15 years. So to go and blame deregulation for this seems particularly odd. Okay, so that is you know, you know, key first step, uh, just to say that uh, when you look at the situation, at least be open-minded to the possibility that government may have something to do with it or may have a lot to do with it. Uh, so, you know, second key point is there are actually a number of things that government plausibly has done that, that uh, has made the problem worse. Uh, so particularly you can take a look at uh, you know, that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, uh, two government-sponsored two, two government corporations, which are in as big trouble as anybody else. So it's not like when government is involved, they somehow become far-seeing and, avoid the, and uh, can see through the problem. Okay, so I mean I think that's 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 uh, you know a, a key part of it. Uh, in the end, what, I'll, what I will say is this: I, mean, I think you know government you know, bears a lot of the responsibility, but uh, people in markets did mess up too. Uh, you know, and probably you know the best way of thinking about this is uh, there's something I call the uh, banana subsidy story. All right, so suppose government goes and subsidizes bananas, uh, and you go and buy you get a bunch of subsidized bananas, and then you go and put a ton of them on your roof, and the roof collapses. All right, in a sense, government is to blame. In the sense, though, uh, you didn't have to put those bananas on your roof. Okay, and I think that is a lot of what has gone on with the financial crisis is government did encourage people to do a lot of things that were foolish, and then people did those things. However, it still would have, it would have been smarter on their part not to have done those things. Right? So, and if they had been a bit more foresighted, they would not have made those mistakes. Uh, the main thing I'll say is, that, is this, which many people find unsatisfactory, but it's worth pointing out. You know, once in a century, a once in a century bad mistake will happen. Okay, and it is not like this was a mistake that was so obvious that a lot of people who were, very, who were smart and clever were uh, months or years before saying, we can, we can tell how this is going to end up. So we, if you are anything like me, I was as surprised by it as anyone, which is just to me that it's actually not, was not a foreseeable thing. It is actually extremely difficult to foresee. Even people who are experts in this industry did not foresee what was happening. Sometimes it happens that a really bad thing happens that was just really hard to see in advance. And then afterwards, everyone said, ah, it, it should have been foreseen. That you know, seems pretty hard to believe. So if you, if you go out on lunch today and you get in a car crash, uh, and you, you break your leg, should you have foreseen that? Well, it's like, you, know, you say, look, like once every 10 years, they get in a car crash and you, and you get injured. Does that show that, you should, that, you know, that you're making mistakes or that you're foolish or in general? I mean, it sounds, I mean, it sounds to me like that is just a case where most of the time, when, when everything seems fine, everything really is fine. Every now and then, though, uh, something seems fine and it's really not fine, and then something bad happens, and then people go and point their fingers and say the market is totally to blame, and let's go and give more power to 
the to, to the part uh, to the part of the system that bore at least a lot of the responsibility. So uh, that is my best story so far. <laughs>